Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today. My name is uh, Sarah Soto. I am a principal with Bressler Emily and Ross. I'm based out of our Florida office. Uh, our presentation today will involve um, litigation experience and trial preparation. I have uh, over 35 years of experience in um, that type of work, representing clients in various industries, including uh, financial services, accounting, and so forth, uh, in both uh, state court litigation, federal court litigation, and in arbitration. I have a distinguished panel here with me, uh, composed of several of my colleagues in different offices. Three of my colleagues, Sharon Coughlin, Tom Roberts, and Angela Turiano, are Bressler principals based in the New York office. Each of them has uh, 25 years or more of uh, litigation experience, representing clients in state and federal courts and in arbitration proceedings, involving disputes um, in various industries um, and in very and various subjects. And our last panelist is my colleague in the Alabama, based in the Alabama office, uh, Brad Brownsville. Uh, Brad uh, is also a principal in the Alabama office, and uh, he has over 23 years of experience representing clients in state courts, federal courts, and in arbitration. And he's been first chair in over 60 arbitration cases. Before we start, just a little of the uh, administrative things. If you have any questions during our presentation, please submit them in the Q&A uh, section of Zoom. And we will either address them at the end if we have any time left after the presentation. And if we don't, we will have a record of them and we will reach out to you after the webinar so that uh, we can address your concerns. Today's discussion is going to center on um, a major part of uh, preparation for a trial or arbitration hearing. It is preparing your witness for direct uh, examination and cross as well, but this really will concentrate on preparation for direct examination, preparing yourself for that direct examination and for opening statements the nature and content of opening statements, and then the direct examination of witnesses at the hearing or at the trial. And now we will kick it off by asking Brad to give us some of his thoughts regarding preparing witnesses for direct examination. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to everybody that has uh, signed up today. You, you make us feel like we, uh, we're going to give you something important. So I hope that we deliver. Um, you know, we could do many, many hours on witness preparation. <clears throat> so I'm just going to uh, kick it off here and um, really get you guys to thinking about the issues and points that you should be wrestling with. Uh, when it comes to preparing witnesses. From the top, you know, uh, trial lawyers in general, you know, we, we like to talk. We like to stand up and argue. We like to give opening statements. We like to have a thorough command of the material. And that's a good thing. Uh, but the, the rub is your case is going to be largely won or lost uh, on the witnesses. Uh, those and those are the people that the arbitrators are most interested in hearing. And so really, when you start your witness preparation, you need to have that in mind and go into your witness preparation with the understanding that you really don't need to be doing all the talking. I have sat through countless, countless witness preparation sessions where the lawyer doing the preparing spoke 65 to 70% of the time. That's not good. It's not good that the lawyer has a command of the material. The witness needs to have a command of the material. And so one of the first things that I do just to, just to throw a tip out there and then I'll let others respond is I try to teach my associates and younger partners to 
stick to asking questions, uh, excuse me, stick to asking que questions in your witness preparation session. Uh, don't be conversational. Don't try to put words in the witness's mouth. You need to ask who, what, when, where, and how questions. That will get you as the attorney uh, used to uh, conducting a good direct examination, and that will get the witness used to hearing the questions and answering appropriately for a witness examination. Uh, Sean, I'll throw it out to you. What what sort of tips do you do you like to give the, the people that you are mentoring when you walk into a witness prep session with a witness? I like to make sure that witnesses use their own words and that my colleagues don't try and interject their view of the case on those witnesses. I think our view of the case really needs to develop from what our witnesses tell us about what happened. Um, you know, it's one thing to just look at the paper. It's another thing to talk with individuals and get their background, uh, get their recollection about things and really probe and make sure that their recollection stands up. But if you start interjecting your words and it sounds like the lawyer speaking on the stand as opposed to the actual witness, I, I think the witness loses some credibility. Tom, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, and I agree with Brad's general point that, you know, the witness is really the star of the show here. Uh, the lawyers are there to, to, to get the story out, but they need to tell the story. They need to tell it in their own words and they need to tell it in a manner that's persuasive from their perspective. Um, you can, by overly prepping a witness, and when I say overly prepping, I mean by putting words in their mouth, um, it, it's very dangerous and it's a slippery slope. They lose credibility, they lose it quickly. And um, I, I just think it makes for a very, very awkward and, and somewhat stilted testimony. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. You have, I've seen it before, you have the witness that is too practiced, too scripted, um, and they get the question and they're trying, you can see them trying to think about what their lawyer told them to say in response, and they're trying to say the exact words. And that is a huge mistake. And you lose, like you guys, everyone's saying, um, the witness loses all its credibility. So it's very important that that Q&A in prep is, yes, you can talk about the case and talk about what's going on, but it has to be you can practice the witness answering, but the, what, the way the witness wants to answer the question, not the way you think that the witness should be answering the question. So that's very important. And as part of your preparation, since uh, many hearings and trials are going to be virtual, at least to some extent in the future, uh, what do you want to do in terms of uh, preparing the witness from the standpoint of technology? Well, so that adds, you know, another element completely to, to your witness prep. Not only do you have to get the witness very comfortable with the question and answer process and very comfortable with that witness's recollection of the words that were exchanged in any critical meetings or phone calls, you now have to add on top of that the fact that the witness is not going to be sitting in a room with live people, they're going to be just like we are, just a, a face and perhaps upper body on a screen. Uh, so one thing you have to do for the witness, for yourself and everybody who's going to be involved is you have to uh, prepare and practice often with the technology. I, I'll give you a great story. This is my third or fourth webinar uh, to do about Zoom arbitrations in various formats. I have the same equipment. I leave it set up in my office, microphone, camera, computer, lights, everything. I don't touch it. I don't even breathe on it because I don't want anything to go wrong. And I'll be darned if I get in the office today to get ready for this seminar and my microphone inexplicably doesn't work and my external camera inexplicably doesn't work. So, you know, things, Technology will fail on you. So you, you have to practice to eliminate as many technological failures as possible, number one. And number two, you have to have a backup plan. Right now, I'm not even using my good camera because I can't get it 
to work for whatever reason. I'm using the internal camera on my computer. That could be very frustrating if it happens to a witness who's already nervous and about to, uh, you know, to give some important testimony in a case that could affect that person's life or career. So you have to get them comfortable, not only with technology, but the fact that there can be uh, some hitches along the way. Which is why I think, Brad, you need to do your prep sessions in the same format that you expect your witness to testify in. Correct. So if you expect them to testify via Zoom, you've got to make sure the documents are presented to them via Zoom and shared with them the way that's going to happen at the hearing. You might have that backed up hard copy set, but you've got to get them flexible and willing to do with what you think is going to happen, or they're going to panic, and they're, they're, you're really not going to get their story out. And, and just to add to that, I think you just need to go into each virtual hearing anticipating that there's going to be a problem. And you always have to have somebody on hand that knows this technology backwards and forwards that is going to be there. And so there's no panic. You call that person and they're the ones that are going to be able to fix the issue. So you kind of have to anticipate thinking something's going to go wrong and then hopefully it won't, but you'll be prepared. Yeah, prepare for the worst, you know, expect the best, prepare for the worst. Yes, and when you're preparing the witness- There's gonna be a hiccup and don't be, don't get rattled by it. It's just the way it is. That's and- just like uh, in court. Exactly. And don't ever forget to tell your witness when you're preparing him that no matter how long you discuss the witness, no matter how many documents you show the witness, no matter how many times you have a conversation about the case, when you get to the hearing, there will always be a surprise. There will always be something that came up that uh, you did not expect. That's just the nature of the beast in an arbitration proceeding. In court, it's gonna be a little bit safer because you are gonna have had depositions and the witness will probably have been deposed in advance, but in an arbitration proceeding with a limited discovery, there's always going to be a surprise. So warn the witness that uh, what you're going over are the issues and the subjects that you believe, that, that you know that you're going to question the witness about, and that uh, then you'll be questioned by the other side and X, Y, and Z might come up. And always warn the witness that uh, they can expect that there will be something that will come up that has not been covered, and that they should uh, deal with that question, whatever it is, by doing the same thing that you've told them to do with regard to everything you have covered, which is to listen to the question, tell the truth, and answer the question that uh, you're being asked. I'll just add quickly to that, Sarah, before we go on to the next topic. You know, in general, one of your main roles as an attorney in you don't think about it this way, but you're, you're in effect managing emotions. And so you have to make sure that you keep your witness on an even emotional keel. One thing that I tell witnesses uh, up front is I don't really like to object a lot during uh, my own witness's testimony because it seems to raise the temperature of the room. It seems to make them anxious and I've found over many years of doing this that they seem to do much better if you allow them to sort of work through the more difficult questions, even if they may be objectionable, because it keeps their emotions down at a manageable level. You're right there, Brad. And the other thing, too, I found is that even though objections might be proper, you look like you're hiding something when you object too much. So I, I tell my witness the same thing, that I rarely object unless it's absolutely necessary. And of course, that might be a little different depending on the forum that you're in. In an arbitration, that'd be 100% uh, that way. In uh, court where objections might actually be upheld and they might actually be useful to you in terms of uh, what evidence is and is not allowed, um, you might want to take a slightly different uh, approach Although it will always be true that uh, when you're objecting in front of uh, a fact finder, whether it be a jury or an arbitration panel, if you do it too often, uh, the fact finder is going to get the idea that uh, you're trying to hide something from them, even if you're not. I agree with that. Uh, if you're in front of a judge, a bench trial, it's one thing. But if you've got a jury, you've got to be very mindful of when you're objecting, even though it might be absolutely proper. 
All right, and with that, let us move on to the next subject. We've now prepared, you have now prepared the witness. Now you're going to start preparing yourself. What are you gonna do, Brad? Well, you have to be organized, plain and simple. If you're not a very organized lawyer, you're not gonna be a very good lawyer. Uh, and exhibits is where organization really matters. Uh, many cases these days, thanks to the explosion of emails, and other electronically stored information are very paper intensive. Um, you have to have a very thorough command of your exhibits. And so you have to spend a lot of time with them up front, uh, having them organized. You know, I won't go over the, the basics. I think we all understand what those are in terms of notebooks, things being neatly tabbed, things being uh, you know, organized properly, Bates labeled properly. More than anything, make sure your exhibits look good. You know, I do a lot of cases for clients in the financial services industry where uh, we rely because uh, it's the law on disclosure documents. And often disclosure documents are not necessarily the prettiest, uh, you know, 18 point font, easy to read documents because you're packing a lot of important material in there uh, that needs to be disclosed to the customer. Uh, years ago, I found that when we were preparing for some cases with some important disclosure documents that the documents through copying and Bates labeling by computer had become even smaller and harder to read. And so it's really hard to stress the importance of disclosure documents when you're presenting a copy to a finder of fact that is having difficulty reading the document. So make sure first and foremost that you get the best copy you can of any document and you make it readable and legible so that people can read it and understand it. Uh, you know, I know I turned 50 this past year and my eyesight is not what it was uh, 25 years ago. So, you know, your arbitration panel, your judges, your juries are going to be the same thing. So that's first and foremost. Uh, and then I'll throw it out there. One thing I've found some success with here lately, and I want to hear what my other panelists have to say is, especially in arbitrations, is considering a joint exhibit book. Uh, Angela, I'll throw it out to you. What, what do you think about the, the efficacy and the value of trying to agree in advance with opposing counsel on having a book of joint exhibits? So if you have the time, which is always a big if, I think that joint exhibit books can be very, very effective. Um, everyone knows about sitting in an arbitration where you have, you know, the claimant has claimant binder one through eight and respondent has respondent binder one through 12 and you have 112 exhibits and all many, many exhibits are exactly the same. And you have the arbitrators up there like you know, shuffling through their papers, trying to figure out where they're going. It makes for a very unorganized, inefficient hearing. So if you have the time, and I, we, when we were prepping for today, we came, we uh, were talking about whether we've ever had a panel order a joint exhibit book. And I have had that in like two or three occasions where a panel has actually ordered it. The only issue with it is you have to actually, it's a lot of work on the front end, but if you can do it and you can organize it, um, that's great, and it makes for a much more streamlined hearing. Um, one thing that can come up is, you know, then one issue that comes up when you have a joint exhibit book, however, is that the your adversary is going to see documents that, um, you know, maybe it was the email that was hidden in the doc in email number a thousand out of you know eight, out of ten thousand that they didn't look at, and now they're going to see that you have it. Um, so that would be an issue that would come up and um, depending on the arbitration and the circumstances, perhaps that would be a document you could set aside and not include in the joint exhibit book. You have a little bit more leeway in an arbitration, but I think overall, if you have the time, um, I think joint exhibit book is a good idea. Um, Sean, do you have any thoughts on that topic? I've always thought they were a good idea. I, I think also um, sometimes, especially if you have a cooperative adversary, you might start focusing on something you really need to have focused on for your client and be in a position to advise your client in a better way about what's coming and how you think your adversary is going to use something as they're put together in a joint exhibit book. And while that might sound like uh, it has consequences of the hearing, it could have consequences where you decide, you know, you're not going to go forward with this hearing. You're going to change the strategies. You're going to change 
you know, the value you have on that case. So more information, I think, for both sides is always better. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, I, you know, I've never had a panel order me um, to, to do a joint book. Obviously, in federal court, it's it's the norm. And, and in most state courts, it's the norm. The um, But even when I can't get an adversary to agree on a joint ex exhibit book in an arbitration proceeding, I invariably try to get them to agree to some of the basics, you know, the new account documents, the monthly statements, everything. It just streamlines things so much rather than having two sets of the same documents in two different books. So, and, and usually they'll agree to that. Um, you know, there are some claimants counsel or who want to have that smoking gun issue. Um, you know, I, I've never really, had a problem with that because um, I do read all the emails. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, it's, it's, it's definitely the best way to conduct the hearing. If you can get that joint book in the absence, try and come up with some compromise that at least part of it can be done jointly. All right. But what if you have a situation as we often encounter in more complex cases, what if you have a situation in which you have, you know, like, the ideal adversary, a person that is willing to agree to a joint exhibit book and you can come to agreements with them. But uh, this joint exhibit book turns out to not be, you know, 10 exhibits. It turns out to be 159, 1,000 maybe. Okay, so now you're going to have a situation in which you have a witness who's gonna testify, let's say the next day, that you're gonna put on on direct and uh, clearly it's not, it's gonna be a toughie to have uh, the person uh, be ready to go through that many exhibits uh, from a joint exhibit book. Do you want to put together a separate set of exhibits that you're going to open and provide to your adversary and use with the witness at, uh, during the testimony? So I think what you can do is break it. You've got your joint exhibit book and you can turn around beforehand and say, you know, when Miss Jones testifies, we're going to use the following exhibits and, and, and almost put together a subset. And I think that's important to do for the, for the judge, for the jury, for the arbitrators. So it streamlines the process. Otherwise, you're going to have too many people going, you know, from exhibit number 13 to 47 to 56. And so by putting together that subset, you can keep people focused on what you want them focused on. And, and there, I think it's also important to only figure out what you absolutely need that witness to look at. Because if they start looking at, like you said, 150,000 exhibits, all of those exhibits become meaningless. But if you have them looking at six or seven exhibits and you spend some time with them and they explain why they're important, they become important. All right, and would uh, your thoughts be any different if we were talking about uh, defending a case or prosecuting a case in the courthouse versus defending a case in arbitration? Because obviously the discovery parameters in court are gonna be very, very different from what they're going to be in an arbitration proceedings in, in a major way at least. And that is that you're gonna have their positions in uh, the courthouse and uh, you're going to confront witnesses uh, for the first time with X, Y, and Z exhibit that uh, they do not necessarily, they have not necessarily practiced or considered in when they worked on their testimony with uh, their lawyer. In an arbitration, that's not gonna happen. Uh, there's not gonna be, or most likely that's not gonna happen. There's not gonna be a deposition of the witness that's going to testify and do you have any concerns regarding providing all of the exhibits in a joint exhibit book that when you get uh, to the hearing, you are not going to get uh, the fresh first reaction from the witness to a particular document. You're gonna get uh, a reaction that has already been uh, very rehearsed because you gave them all the documents you were gonna use. I think a lot of times a good attorney on the other side is gonna prepare them for those exhibits anyways. You, I think you should always assume your adversary is going through the documents and the information the same way you are. You should always assume, but often that assumption turns out not to be based in reality. So 
and, it takes and, me back a little bit to my question. That's okay. Well, I, I think in an I, arbitration, it made no. It, it would make no difference in how you would uh, feel about a joint exhibit book. That's pretty off. That's that's pretty much how I feel. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, I think in an arbitration, as opposed to court, where you have less leeway, in an arbitration, just because you have a joint exhibit book, doesn't that doesn't preclude you from using additional exhibits. Yep. Um, and I, I think it depends on the situation and what the what the agreed upon parameters were with regard to the joint exhibit book. All right. Which brings it to, back to me for the next slide. This is back to you, preparing your slide. So um, Brad spoke about organization before the hearing, which of course is uh, of paramount importance. But in addition to organizing your exhibit, you have to organize yourself mentally uh, for the case. And one of the most important things you can do when trying a um, when doing a trial or a hearing and preparing yourself is developing a theory or theme of the case. Um, it's gotta be something that is um, simple, rela relatable and indisputable. It's gotta be something that will resonate with the fact finder. Um, you have to continue or it's important to continue to interject this theory or theme throughout the hearing in your direct, through your witnesses um, and in your closing argument. And I know Sean and Tom are gonna talk about that a little bit in the next couple slides. Um, examples of some um, theories of a case is um, in, a, let's say, a securities arbitration, um, you have um, uh, a theory would be accountability or responsibility for informed decisions or informed risk taking. So, you know, something like claimant was only too happy to take, un to take the informed risks associated with his investment strategy when he reaped the rewards. And you turn it on its head, he was only happy to take the informed risks when he got the reward, when he got the loss. Then he turned around and blamed his FA. So that's an accountability responsibility for your actions theme. Um, then you, and I use that a lot after the tech rec days. I had this whole analogy with my mother investing, which I won't waste everyone's time with, but it's um, it, it, you have to kind of like say, you know, um, something that people can resonate with. Like, why did you decide not to take that risk? And now um, this person did, and they obviously were making more money than I was, but when they stopped making the money, they got mad and blamed their FA. In a different kind of case, like say a sexual harassment case, you might do something like a sensationalism versus facts or versus reality theme. So, you know, something like the plaintiff does not want facts to get in the way of her um, fanciful tale of intrigue and drama that she br brings in the, in the complaint. Because oftentimes these ha sexual harassment claims, you know, they talk about all these horrible allegations, but really when you look at the underlying facts, they don't support these fanciful, this fanciful tale that the plaintiff has come up with. So that's what you want to like the jury or the judge to understand is that, you know, while this sounds terrible on paper, this is really not what happened. It's just a tale and these are the facts and this is sensationalism. Sensationalism sells, but you got to get away from that and look at the facts. Just examples of the like, theories of the case that, that you can use to have these um, ideas resonate in the minds of your fact finder so that they, you keep referring back to it as you go throughout um, and I'll, I'll add in on top of that, Angela, you, you know, some of you may think, well, yes, of course, we're taught that in trial advocacy, you got to have a theme and a theory, but the, the, the utility of it is, is apparent throughout the decision making process in the case. You know, there are many times in the case where you hear opposing witnesses say things that are flatly untrue or are a tremendous exaggeration from the demonstrable facts. And you just, you being the lawyer, you just wanna set them straight and show that they're not telling the truth or they're not accurate. But a lot of times it's uh, inaccuracies about facts that don't really matter. And so you have to walk a tightrope between putting a dent in the credibility of opposing witnesses on collateral matters versus pushing forward uh, to the finish line. And, and I think that's where the theory and the theme of the case helps, you know, when in doubt, when it's closed, if this really isn't pushing your theme, you know, maybe you shouldn't waste too much time showing that the claimant was wrong about, you know, when a meeting happened or what was said or some other, uh, collateral issue. Right. Right. That, cause that's not the issue. And you can focus the jury or the panel on what the issue is and it's, it's consistent with your theme. And along those lines, when you're prepping your witnesses, you should, it's helpful to tell them the theme because then they under have, they have a big picture understanding of your case. So you can prep your witness, you know, for as long as you want. There's always going to be questions or a line of questioning that comes up 
that they're not going to, maybe they get confused. They don't know how to answer it. If they have that theme or theory in their head, it makes it easier for them to respond with something that's consistent with that theme or theory. Um, I think it helps developing that with the witnesses by listening to them, by interviewing them beforehand. hundred percent. Agreed, yeah, Sean. You, you know, the only way you develop your theme is through the investigation and discovery process. And it, right. it oftentimes that changes throughout, you know, what your strongest theme is may, may alter, well, may change course during investigation and discovery. And to get to Brad's point, I agree that that white noise, and if you keep addressing all those little things, they just distract from what it is you're, you're setting out to do. So keep it focused on your theme um, rather than tripping up every little, you know, mistruth that the other side may say. Right. Don't focus on it too much. Yep. A hundred percent. Um, so as I said, you know, you, you want to speak to your witnesses and prep them on the theme, maybe to help to maybe develop the theme with your witnesses. Um, but the other thing you want to think about in addition to the theme is who your witnesses are going to be. Um, consider like a list of witnesses and determine in your head, do I need to call all these witnesses? What is this each witness going to bring to the table? Is this witness going to help develop my theme? Um, do I, what's going to happen if I don't call this witness? Do I need to call witness A and witness B or just one of them? I, um, I sit as a FINRA arbitrator and I've seen time and time again that some of these attorneys, uh, some like respondents counsel, very, very good attorneys, but they call multiple witnesses to say the same thing and it's just not necessary. Now, sometimes you want duplicative testimony, don't have a lot of documents, you need a lot, some, something to support your narrative, but sometimes, you know, if you, you, the more witnesses you put on the stand, the more it opens them up to cross, the more it opens up your, your hearing to issues. And so you really want to streamline, just like you want to streamline your documents and your exhibits, you want to streamline your witnesses and only utilize and choose the witnesses that you really need to advance your case. Um, once you decide who your witnesses are, um, decide what you want to get out of each witness. What are the four or five most important you want to get, points you want to get out of the witness? And then once you figure that out, you know, write it down. Some people think, oh, I don't need to put the, I know what I want to say. I've been doing this for years. So I don't need to write it down. Write down the points you need to make. And then as you're making, as you're doing the Q&A, you could check it off. Just say, all right, that's got, he said that, said that. Same, same is true with the exhibits. Um, what exhibits am I trying to get out from each witness? And as you do it, check it off. Um, and go through, go through your witness Q&A and you can stop and you can assess, where am I in the middle, middle of your testimony? Some people don't like that little bit of awkward silence, but you know, take care of that easily with, um, just one moment, Madam Chair, just one, moment, just one moment, Your Honor, take a look at what you're doing, especially at the end, you're, you're done with your Q&A, um, or you think you're done, take a minute, look at your questions, are the, the four or five points, did they come out, did you get all your exhibits in, um, and only then do you pass, pass the witness to your, to your adversary. The last thing you want is to, you know, be done with your witness and not have achieved one of the goals that you set forth for your witness, and it's really just all about the preparation and thinking things through beforehand. Um, which brings us to our next um, topic is the actual trial. Um, so once you're through prepping, unless anyone has anything to add, um, the, we're gonna talk about effective um, methods of opening and direct while at the hearing. And Sarah, if you wanna give the code now, it's probably a good time. Uh, yes, um, for, those of us, for those of you that are wanting to see the elite credit for this presentation, the first code is hybrid, that's H-Y-B as in boy, R-I-D. All right, so you've gotten to the trial after you've done all of this preparation. And um, turns out, let's just say it turns out that your trial is going to be virtual, right? So if, when a trial is virtual, you lose the visual cues that you have when it is in person. And so, for example, it's harder to do the things that you would ordinarily just try to do as a matter of course in person, such as you know, not interrupting, uh, not talking over other people in the video conference and that type of thing. You have to make a conscious effort to avoid that if you're gonna have a virtual hearing because um, otherwise uh, it, it, on Zoom, no one can understand anyone when people are talking over each other. They probably can't do that that well in person anyway, but they definitely cannot do it <laughs> in uh, the Zoom setting. So try to 
be very mindful of that if you're gonna do a virtual presentation. And pay attention to what view you're most comfortable with. I mean, Zoom has, you know, a gallery view and a speaker view. If you wanna see the witnesses face when they're answering and concentrate on that, then uh, obviously you'd wanna use the speaker view. You may want to see, take a look at the other participants as well, or at some of the participants. You may wanna see, you know, what the arbitrator's reaction is to a particular testimony. I leave that up to what your personal preference is, because I've found that people have uh, different uh, preferences in that area. I don't think there's one that's right or wrong. I think it's uh, whatever works uh, the best for you. And so now we're gonna go to, you got to the trial. Um, presumably you dealt with the details if it's a virtual one as opposed to in person. And so Tom, tell us a little bit about opening statements. Well, you know, openings are, the, the, the old adage goes, you know, first impressions are, are the, they matter. They're the most important. So take some time to develop an opening statement. They are your first chance to not only establish your own credibility, but certainly the credibility of your client to the panel, to the trier of fact, be it a judge or a jury. So it, it's important to take time and develop and use the theme that you have developed as your lead in your opening statement. Take that theme, distill it to two sentences. One is better if you can. And present that theme as persuasively as you can in a very short sentence, because that is gonna be the anchor that, that the panel or the trier effect is always going to go back to. That's going to be something that will leave the most lasting impression on them. And because it's at the beginning of the hearing, the, the trier of fact is fresh. They're curious. They're paying the most attention that they're ever going to pay to you during that point in time. So use that opportunity to really push your theme and, and get it out there. Um, so state it first, okay? The, the, the theme, again, is, is, is really <laughs> the way to, that you're going to convey the entire case to them. So once you get that theme out in front of them, <clears throat> then through the use of facts that you've developed, start to get them all out in a manner that is very precise and keeps with the timing of how you're going to bring your evidence in, either be it in prosecuting a case or defending it. So when I say that use the timeline, I mean also transport the panel or the trier effect to the time that the events took place. Let's face it, these trials take place years after the events that took place, okay? So if you can put the panel back into the time where it happened, invariably, they will judge it from that time point, okay? Not in the context of what's going on presently, but it's important to take them back to the time that the events took place. That's where a timeline as a demonstrative, I think is a very important tool to use in an opening. I don't like to use a lot of exhibits that I expect would be used during the trial in an opening, but I think as a demonstrative, I think a timeline is a terrific thing to use in opening. You can set out your entire case in a very orderly fashion, and it really helps a trier of fact kind of get an overview, a broad overview that serves as their guide or their index to the entire case that you're gonna present. Um, a couple of things that I never really like to do is I don't, I'd like to have it, the, I like to have an opening that's kind of conversational and not use a whole lot of fancy lawyer words or anything like that. I, I think that you just want to be as matter of fact and as plain spoken as you can be as if you were having a conversation with a friend over dinner, okay? Um, the more legalistic you get, I think the more uh, inclined or, or the, the the, the, the trier fact's not going to be as attentive to those types of, types of words. 
So I try and be very conversational. Um, the things that I always like to do is I like to be concise. I like to promise only what I know I'll be able to deliver during that hearing. Um, I don't like to overstep and promise more because I think that always comes back to haunt you. The other thing I think is critical is to really personalize your client. Um, you know, typically I'm on the defendant side and it's usually a large corporation, um, a large financial institution, but those institutions only work through people. So you have a star witness, be it an FA, a branch manager, whoever it is, they need to be personalized during that opening statement. So your client is not just some corporate entity that is cold or has nothing to do with what took place. Personalize your client, personalize the FA, whoever it is, bring them, because they're likely your star witness, bring them to focus. And then the other thing is always be respectful. Um, be respectful of the process, be mindful of the gravity of the situation, not only for your client, but for the other side and for everybody else who's there. So I, I think that, you know, never be cavalier, always be respectful. And I think that that adds to your credibility as well as your clients. Um, I, a couple of things that I don't like to do during a, an opening is, I don't like to get cross or argumentative. Um, I like to be very, very to the point, very succinct, very calm, very reassuring. Um, I don't like to repeat arguments that the other side unless there's something that's so glaring or so offensive that it needs to be addressed. Otherwise, I just think you're, you know, giving more attention to, to their side than it warrants during the opening. So I'm very, very mindful of that. Um, I don't like to go overboard on exhibits that I would use at the trial, only those, a few demonstratives. And finally, I don't like to read an opening. Um, I think an outline is useful. Um, and in fact, um, I rely on them all the time because it's easy to forget a point you want to make. So just have a couple of key things that you want to get out, four, five, six words on a sheet of paper, glance down once in a while. They're just triggers for your memory to get out what it is you want to want to get out. Sean, I, I see you kind of chomping at the bit here. So what yeah, do you no, have to add? I, I agree with all of that. I, I do think it's important to write out that outline. Um, and, and then break it down to those final points. I, I just find that putting that outline together really makes sure that you're, you're going to make your message succinct and clear. But I recall once a judge telling me when I asked to go back to my office to get my outlines, and he was like, I know you wrote them, but you never look at them anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't know how to take that at the time. As time's gone on, I've, put, I've taken it as a compliment. Um, I think the only thing I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Oh, go ahead, Angela, please. Um, I would say the only thing I would quickly add, I agree with everything Sean said is, excuse me, Sean and Tom. But what I like to do sometimes is um, after the claimant does his opening, I like to throw in him or her, I like to throw in a couple things that the claimant said and quickly, um, quickly just uh, flat, flat it out and make it have no, you know, no bearing on the fact finder. You know, you say something like, you know, so Mr. Smith, you know, said this, this, and this, but as you, as you can, will see, the evidence will show that has nothing to do with the issue that you're here to decide. The issue that you're here to decide is this. And they're just saying this to focus your attention away from this issue and kind of like taking a moment to dismiss what they're saying and just refocus. Don't spend too much time, but just like give it like initially address it and then go right into your opening. And on this point, I feel that there's also a difference between the approach that you want to take in uh, a court proceeding versus the approach that you want to take or might want to take in uh, an arbitration. In a court proceeding, an opening is subject to obviously a number of rules uh, of the quorum, rules of the court, the ethical rules, etc. In an arbitration, there's no judge to say, you're not going to talk about that, that point right now because it's overly prejudicial and not going to be admissible. Okay, there's not going to be any of that. So I think that in an arbitration proceeding, I personally favor 
having your presentation, of course, having it outlined and being prepared, and I couldn't agree more with Tom's point that uh, you must be accurate on opening statement because your credibility during a proceeding is every bit as important as the credibility of the witnesses that you bring with you. So do not promise what you're not sure that you can deliver. So you should have your presentation. However, I feel that in an arbitration, it is often necessary and desirable to, before you launch into your presentation, uh, address three or four horrors that came out <laughs> during the presentation uh, by the opposing counsel, because those, those things sometimes stick in the mind. So you wanna pick out the ones that uh, you know are not accurate, that you know they're not gonna be able to prove, that you know would be very prejudicial if they actually were true. And you want to let the arbitration panel know from the beginning that uh, you're hearing that now, but that's not gonna happen when uh, we actually get down to having the evidence in the case. And so Angela, we're at the trial and we're gonna do the direct examination of your witness. What's gonna happen? Okay, so uh, before we get to the substantive q and I'm gonna give you um, everybody some tips when you're doing a virtual presentation. Um, as you can see from our title, we initially were just gonna do a, a, a virtual direct and opening and we decided we would expand it in keeping and in being consistent with the fact that the world is opening up. We figured we'd give a little hybrid presentation on direct and opening with some, with some virtual tips. So I'm just gonna go through, I see we have 15 minutes left, so I'm gonna just go through these kind of quickly. And speaking with virtual and tips, um, if everyone noticed, we are having a little bit of technological difficulties with our slides at the moment, so please bear with us. Um, so this is what happens, that's why you gotta go through this stuff so beforehand. You all know, we did have a plan B and a plan C. Yes, we did. We did have a plan B and a plan C, but unfortunately, we have, no, plan D. we have no and D. We have. <laughs> we have no D, so we'll have to just work with it. Um, so just, just some virtual, quick virtual tips. Um, and it, some of them may seem obvious, but some people you just don't think of these things. The first thing I'll bring up is frequent communications with your witnesses. When you're doing a virtual presentation as opposed to a hearing or trial that's in person, your witness is not just sitting outside the hearing or the jury or the trial room. They're somewhere. And you have to make sure that that witness is, is you're keeping in touch with them and letting them know, you know, you're going to be on in five, you're going to be on in 10. Make sure that they're in, you're in constant communication with your witness so that there's no delay and you don't frustrate the judge or the panel. Um, something else real quick is camera positioning. You should prep yourself and your witness for the camera positioning. Too many people, they do this, they do that. It's not good. You have to make sure your camera's in the right place. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's, um, it can be very distracting and I'm talking about distractions in just a minute. Um, something else with your witness is, um, and this kind of goes back to the prep, make sure that your witness understands that they need to be looking eye contact in the camera. Um, some witnesses might be nervous and they'll, you'll find them and that's what they do, they look away and they're constantly doing this because they're just nervous and that looks suspicious. Somebody keeps kind of doing this because they're afraid to look into the camera. Got to make sure that the, tell the witness, remind them right before they're going to go on. Remember, look in the camera. Um, make sure your lighting is right. You have bad lighting; it's distracting. Um, as the as the lawyer, make sure that your outline that we talked about that's so important is not some is not over here, so that you're constantly doing this and looking in the wrong place. Um, monitors. I uh, purchased a nice monitor when this whole pandemic work from home thing happened, and I, you guys are all nice and big over here, but here I, I have my small Mac. So I'm always inclined to do this, which I do on meetings, but today I'm focusing here, but just be mindful of looking into the camera, looking at the panel um, or the judge. Um, something you might wanna consider when doing your Q&A and doing your direct is pinning the witness so that the witness is the focus and turning yourself off so that the, the witness is, the, that your um, direct witness is the star of the show and, and the fact finder is listening to that witness. Um, Talk about distractions and then we'll move on to Sean. Um, again, lighting is important. Yesterday we were practicing and Sean, was, his room was super bright. It was very, very distracting. He fixed it today, but that's very important. Your room distractions, where, where is your witness sitting? Um, I have a fan here, right? If I, was, if I was talking like this, pretty soon the fact finder would just start maybe staring at that fan and stop paying attention to what I'm talking about. These are the little things you have to be cognizant of in the virtual setting that you might not um, you might not normally think about. Um, 
And then just the only other thing I will add before we move on to Sean and substantive Q&A is, you know, it's more difficult to pay attention on a Zoom hearing than it is in a real hearing, just because just you're not in the courtroom, you're not in a hearing room. People are in their homes and are easy, more easily distracted. So, I mean, I already have a propensity to speak super fast. So you need to exaggerate that even more. You want to be more, a little slower, a little bit more deliberate in your Q&A in a virtual setting than you would be in an in-person setting. Um, and I think someone mentioned before about interruptions. I think less interruptions is less is more with interruptions in um, on a virtual setting because again, more hard to follow. It streamlines the process and it makes it. You just want to you just want to keep everybody focused, the, the fact finder focused. So the lighting needs to be good, good eye contact, as little a distraction as possible. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Sean for his mastery of the direct Q and A. So, so I don't know about it being a mastery, but I, I wanted to do direct Q&A because I've watched too many quote unquote direct examinations over the years which, where they really weren't direct examinations. They were examinations where the questioning attorney on direct examination asked far too many um, leading questions because that individual wanted to make sure their story was out and the whole room, whether it was a jury or whether it was an arbitration, really never heard from the witness in the language that mattered to the witness. And, and I think it's very important when we're doing direct exams to really change our posture. You know, when opening statements or cross-examination, the lawyer is the center of the room. But on direct examination, where you are presenting the plaintiff's case or your defense case, that individual is the center of the room. And it's really important to be mindful of that and get the jury to pay attention to your witness, make sure your witness's points are understood in simple language, make sure they're remembered, and make sure, most importantly, they're believed. And, and, and I think how you go about doing that is you go back to the basics like we talked about from the very beginning. What's our theme of the case? How are we weaving this together um, as we're putting together our presentation? And I think it's important to lead with you know, some of the most important facts right away. Um, what, what does that witness want to say? Why is, it, why is he or she testifying? Why is it important? Lead with that. And then as you get the response to each of your questions, on occasion, take the, take the answer that you just heard and make sure you're listening and use those facts in developing your next question. Because what that allows you to do is it allows you to you know, repeat and get that important information out to the panel or the judge or the jury again, and it gives the basis of your next question. Um, I would say take on virtual, take down, take down the exhibits after somebody's testified, so people take, pay attention to the witness. Um, like, let's stop, stop share, right? Now everybody can just see me, they're not looking at, you know, other things that can become distracting again. And uh, I have to tell you, like with some of the exhibits before, I actually had a practice section, session earlier today with Rebecca Johnson on putting things up and taking things down. And I still managed to mess it up this, this afternoon in front of all of you. And nice job, I, Sean. My, my, my colleagues on the panel are sending me notes, fix this, fix this. And finally, <laughs> I was just like, well, I'm doing the best I can. Um, Listen, and, and you, you outed yourself with and without you. <laughs> I, I, I'm well aware of that. And, um, and that goes to when do you when do you let a, when do you deal with a weakness right on direct examination because oftentimes we have them and and I think sometimes people think oh I'm going to get this weakness out right in the very beginning of when my weak witness testifies I don't think that's a good idea because then it's something the panel judge jury is going to remember I think it's important to take some of your weaknesses and you put them through part middle part of your direct examination. This way, you know, the jury or judge or arbitrators don't hear about this on cross for the first time. You've, you've put it out there, it's there, but it's in the middle. It's not what you begin with, it's not what you end with. And people remember what you begin with and they remember what they end with. And I'll just throw in real quick, Sean, you know, it's, it, 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 it goes all the way back to Richard Nixon it's not the crime, it's the cover up. If you have a bad part of your case, you look much better by just bringing it out, having the witness say whatever they can say about it and being done with it. It looks terrible 
when the claimant's lawyer comes out or the plaintiff's lawyer comes out with a gotcha because then it's just a cover up and cover ups are bad. How do, you, how do you guys deal with that when they call your witness adverse to get that bad thing out right away? Um, I think you need to prep your witness for that event because I, I see it very often in the arbitration context, less often in the court context, that they put your guy on adverse, they call him hostile. And so you, your client has to be ready for it. Your witness has to be ready for it. And they have to be able to explain it um, very matter of factly um, and then put context around it. Because for every bad event, there's usually something around it that's good. Right. So not, it, it, make sure that the witness is prepped on all of it, not just the bad. Um, because it's not surprising that they do get called at first. And that'll go back to Sarah's point. If you if you have a strong suspicion that that's going to happen, maybe you want to touch that on uh, touch that in the opening. Just... Uh, yeah, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Yeah, we slightly disagree there. I don't know if I would agree with that, but anyway. <laughs> and you know, you're going to hear disagreements on this panel because you have seasoned trial lawyers who have a lot of experience, and this is an art. It's not a science. Yeah. Correct. And the important part is, is that you see that it is an issue worth arguing about and that you think about a lot. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting I'm right. Um, <laughs> so. You're clearly not, Tom. I'm not. <laughs> Please, going, going back to direct exams, right? It, you know, I, I think what is important is that we remember that the question should be, you know, I'll put together in a manner so the witness is telling us, you know, when it happened, where it happened, why it happened, what they were doing, what they saw, and so that you can hear from a witness and not from the attorneys. And if it's part of your theme and you keep things constant throughout your case, you're going to, it's gonna resonate with arbitrators or jurors or judges. And, and that's crucial for you to prevail on your case. Um, and I'll throw in real quick too. I, I tell all of my witnesses, you know, I'm going to ask you roughly two different types of questions. Uh, I'm going to ask you who, what, when, and where questions. And for those, I'm looking for short answers. What color was the light? Where were you standing? If I ask you where were you standing, I don't want the witness to give me a complete uh, narrative about what color the light was and what the weather was. Where were you? The other type of question is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the witness, I'm gonna say, hey, tell the panel about that afternoon you were standing on the corner or describe for the panel what the meeting was like. So you're, you're, you're letting the witness know, now's the time for you to tell your story without a lot of interruption uh, versus when I'm really going through just the who, what, when, and where to get it out. And I think the former questioning, the witnesses have the most difficult time with, they, they just, everybody just wants to talk. And you, you, as much as you tell them this, you know, just gonna add, you give me a short answer, short answer, you give them examples. They just keep talking, so. Now let's get to the point that I think every trial lawyer has experienced and not enjoyed during their careers. And that is that you did all this, the witness did all this, you got to the trial or hearing, and now the witness is saying something different from what the witness said during their conversations with you. What do you do if the witness betrays you? If you know how to faint and pull it off and convincingly, you could do that. But other than that, you've got some serious thinking to do. You know, I think you need to turn around and probe with a few questions. If it becomes apparent right there that the witness is not going to change their, what they're saying, you might need to uh, wait through cross and deal with it and think about it more and address those questions on redirect. And you've just got to be mindful of what, what changed between the time that you met, you know, Miss Jones and the time that she showed up to testify about, you know, the... Uh, the homicide she witnessed, right? Um, I think, yeah, I think this comes up in two ways. One is the witness just changes the story, which you can do very little about. The other is if you're asking a question, you're expecting an answer and you're just not getting that answer. I don't think that you should keep trying to get the answer more than one or two questions. Then leave it alone, 
let them get off the stand. Hopefully you can mop it up on some redirect or they'll have an opportunity during cross to get the right answer out. Um, All right, everyone. Thank you so very much uh, for attending. Sorry again for the technical difficulties we had with the PowerPoint for which we're all going to bring Sean. And uh, for the CLE credit uh, that uh, in case you want to get it, the second code is trials, T-R-I-A-L-S. Again, thank you very much for attending. And if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A and we will get back to you. Thank you. Thanks.